Imagine not being able to read the paper because your hands were shaking. Imagine not being able to read newsprint as your world faded to black. The National Federation of the Blind, Newsline Indiana. With your host, Lee Martin, and co-host, Florence Myers McSwine. We want to welcome you to the National Federation of the Blind Newsline Indiana show. And today we have a fantastic guest with us today, and I think you're going to want to stay around and listen. But we're here with the National Federation of the Blind, for those of you that are new to the show. Um, we are a show um, dealing with um, issues uh, related to the blind uh, community. Uh, we're, a part, we're part of the National Federation of the Blind, which is the largest organization of organized blind citizens um, uh, in this country. And we are just proud to say that one of the programs that the National Federation of Blind sponsors um, or has created is the National Federation of the Blind Newsline. Florence, you want to talk a little bit about what the National Federation of the Blind Newsline is? Certainly. Um, Newsline actually is a free service for the blind, visually impaired, and print challenge community, which gives us access to newspapers, magazines, TV guide listings, Walmart, Target circulars. Um, it also gives us breaking news, and it's basically through audio devices, such as our landline phone, our computer, Victorita Stream, mobile phone, um, and um, again, it is free. And this service, once again, you know, has allowed individuals for the first time to read print at their own time and, and, and during their own independence. So it allows us, uh, as blind citizens, to read here in the state of Indiana, like the Indianapolis Star and over 14 other newspapers around the state and also magazines, as Florence indicated, from the AARP to um, all types of magazines that we have. And we'll learn more about that as we go through our show and you watch our commercials. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned and you'll enjoy our guest, Daniel. I just graduated college as a blind student. How can I independently find job listings? Thanks to the National Federation of the Blind, visually impaired Hoosiers can hear newspapers, circulars, and oh, magazines from million across million the globe. It is a fantastic service. Learn more by calling 855-963-6476 or visit nfbnewsline-in.org. We are the nation's blind and we read NFB Newsline. If you or someone you know is visually impaired or print challenged, the National Federation of the Blind has a resource you need. Wow, I scored a touchdown when I found sports on NFB Newsline. I enjoy reading TV guide listings on NFB Newsline. Learn more by calling 855-963-6476 or visit nfbnewsline-in.org. We are the nation's blind. We read NFB Newsline. It's free. Welcome back to the National Federation of the Blind Newsline, Indiana. In today's show, we have our special guest, Mr. Daniel Belding. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, Daniel, tell me something here. Um, as a blind uh, citizen, um, now, how long have you been coping with blindness? I've been blind my whole life. Um, we didn't know until I was about six years old that I had any um, vision problems at all. Um, my kindergarten teacher pointed out to my mom that I just kept getting really close to everything and that I was having trouble paying attention during class, is what they thought. And it actually took a couple of years of some doctors said that I just had ADD and ADHD and um, other um, you know, learning challenges. And then I finally went back. I'm, my family is originally from Alabama and then um, a close family in Mississippi as well. 
And we went to an eye doctor at Mississippi State, and he kind of laughed, and he said, son, you ain't got a whole eyeball in your head. <laughs> so wow. um, my eyes never fully developed, and I have retinitis pigmentosa, or RP for short. And um, so the best vision I ever had was about 2350, and then that was as a child. And then just as the disease progresses, my retinas will deteriorate and um, just lose more sight as time goes on. Uh, so at six years old, they finally recognized that. And that was when it started. We didn't. They put me in eye therapy, thought they could strengthen my eyes, and um, did that for two years. And about eight years old is when they finally uh, would agree that I was legally blind and um, had a visual impairment. And I know I'm 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 legally blind. Well, I'm t totally blind. I call myself <laughs> certified blind. Mm -hmm. I lost my sight at 48. But my heart kind of sank doing to hear that as a six-year-old, uh, um, and I hear it so often. So, um, you know, so you, you've overcome a lot, and, um, you know, you, you went through high school. Uh, did you go through mainstream school, or were mm -hmm. you at the um, school for the blind or visually impaired, or what? I, was, I went through mainstream schooling the whole time. I really fought um, the blindness stuff for a while. I was only blind kid in the school. Um, they tried doing the large print, teaching me how to read large print because I was able to see that. But then after a couple of years, I wasn't able to see large print anymore. And um, I really fought learning Braille because I was during the elective classes in elementary school. And I was the only kid that I had to go and I just felt weird. So I focused more on mobility because I at least got to get out and go around. And while the kids were in class, I got to go to McDonald's. So it kind of made me the cool kid that could bring food back to the class. And um, so I got really good at traveling, just not very good at reading. So um, I spent a lot of time with um, having people read stuff to me, listening to books on tape, um, getting the textbooks and like the 75 cassette tapes you used to get of a textbook. So um, it was definitely a different way. I definitely wish I'd focus more on my Braille skills as a kid. Um, but now as an adult, I've been able to learn Braille and use it on a daily basis. Okay. Now, at um, what point did you, were you introduced to NFE Newsline? So uh, when I was a student at the Colorado Center for the Blind, that is when I first heard about it during my technology class. And that was uh, one of the greatest things for me is I used to just, I thought it was the coolest thing. You'd see the old guy at the coffee shop or reading the newspaper. And I always wondered, you know, what's, what's so interesting in there? How do you, you know, just to know what's going on in the world. And uh, with the little vision I had, I could read the real big um, titles and stuff of some of the articles. And as a kid, I would just make up like what that story was in my head. And for the first time, when I was 27 years old, I could actually read the article, not just the title. So it was really cool just to open up the world to me in that way. So what is one of your favorite publications with the NFB News now? I wouldn't say I have a favorite. I'm really into sports. Mm -hmm. And so I like being able to hear all the different sports from all the different states. Um, like I said, my family's um, in Alabama, Mississippi, and out in Colorado. And now I'm in Indianapolis, so I get to kind of keep up to the times of what's going on, where all my family's at, and um, just be, get, be able to check in on sports everywhere I go. Well, I know that you're into sports, and um, uh, you're into college sports as well? Yeah, I'm a huge Alabama football fan. That's my, that's my number one thing. So my wife loves it during the fall. She knows every Saturday is dedicated to Alabama football. So. Well, I just hate to bust your bubble, but Notre Dame is going to kick the pants out of Alabama this year. <laughs> we might have to make a bet on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, you can create your own uh, newspapers and your own sections of the newspapers. I often, I have a, a sports uh, section that I've created. You know, mm -hmm. I love that feature mm -hmm. uh, with that uh, NFB Newsline. And I also love that one uh, where you can save the article mm -hmm. uh, that you wanted to read. If you're reading an article and you say, well, dang, uh, dang, Notre Dame just kicked the pants off of uh, <laughs> Alabama. I want to keep that article. And you can save that into, yeah. uh, to your inbox, mm -hmm. you know. So that's a great tool. You might want to save it. I might want to delete it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you, you went to the uh, Colorado School for the Blind, which is a, one of the... Um, uh, the, the schools that the National Federation of the Blind offers, one of the mm -hmm. training centers there. Um, you know, we have uh, three training centers across the country, uh, one in Louisiana and uh, one in Minnesota and the one in Colorado. And uh, so you, you, I know you met a lot of people. One of our lead attorneys is out there uh, in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Scott Labar. Scott Labar. Yep. He's a great guy, mm -hmm. you know. So um, uh, with your training there, um, you, you, you know, you, 
it, you enhance yourself. You enhance your life tremendously. I'm seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. So um, now you. You, you got married too, didn't you? I did actually met my wife um, at the Center for the Blind. We were both students there at the same time. And uh, once we graduated, we, we, she started 15 days after I did. We graduated like a week apart. And I um, was offered a job to teach at the Center for the Blind where I taught cane travel. Mm -hmm. And then my wife decided to pursue her master's degree at the University of Denver in social work. And so um, she stayed in Denver, I stayed in Denver teaching and um, really grown our relationship there and um, moved back to Indianapolis together last June. So you are a blind cane traveler, mobility and um, instructor? Yes, sir. I, well, I was when I was back in Colorado. Okay. Okay. So right now uh, you're here in Indiana, mm -hmm. you're married now, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm trusting that you're enjoying this good cold weather here. Oh, I love you got it in, in Colorado as well. The only thing we don't have in Colorado is the wind, and the wind here is ice cold. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> so, uh, so now as, um, as, as we get into our next segment, we want, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, your goals, you know, your ambitions, your desires, okay. you know, uh, your business. Uh, you know, I, I am very interested in in, in your business here and uh, in, in what you're trying to establish. Now, where did you attend college at? I went to a couple different colleges. So I um, was at the University of Northern Colorado for a little while. I also went to Jones County Junior College where I got my associate's degree um, back in Mississippi. And I went to Heritage College to become a personal fitness trainer um, in Colorado as well. So I've been kind of all over the map in colleges trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. So. Wow. And, and all this being blind. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, life it can be very successful as blind persons. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, just just uh, educate our, 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 our listening and viewing audience, you know, about um, you know, the success stories. What, what are some of your successes uh, as a blind citizen? We got about 30 seconds before we go to break. Uh, so my successes, I mean, athletics has always been my thing. So I was, as the only blind kid, um, not just in my school, but in the district, I was a varsity um, starting offensive and defensive lineman for my high school. Um, I was number one in the state in wrestling, um, done rodeo, powerlifting, um, I've uh, played ice hockey my entire life, and um, sports is really my big thing. I graduated with honors from college, so it's always, most of my life's been focused around sports, but I'd say my greatest accomplishment, you know, as a person of any, you know, blind or not, is uh, getting to marry my wife, so. Wow, so we're going to take us a short break, and I'm just amazed at all this all this sports activity and how you're doing with your life as a blind citizen. Mm -hmm. So we'll be right back. Thousands of Indiana residents feel isolated from the world due to vision problems. Thanks to the National Federation of the Blind, visually impaired Hoosiers can hear newspapers, circulars, and magazines from across the globe. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm blind. I read Stars and Stripes on NFB Newsline. Learn more by calling 855-963-6476 or visit nfbnewsline-in.org. Subscribe free to NFB Newsline. If you or someone you know is visually impaired or print challenged, the National Federation of the Blind has a resource you need. Wow, I scored a touchdown when I found sports on NFB Newsline. I enjoy reading TV guide listings on NFB Newsline. Learn more by calling 855-963-6476 or visit nfbnewsline-in.org. We are the nation's blind. We read NFB Newsline. It's free. Well, welcome back to the National Federation of the Blind Newsline, Indiana. And uh, we have our guest, Daniel Belding. And Daniel, we were just speaking about goals. And um, you, well, you were talking about your, your loving sports. And speaking of goals, let's talk about what's going on with you now. So right now, um, we are trying to start the first Indiana blind hockey team. And so when people hear blind hockey, they think it's an oxymoron and just kind of laugh no matter what circles I'm talking in. 
And, yeah, because um, I'm about ready to, I'm, <laughs> I'm blind and I'm trying to figure this out myself. So, mm -hmm. okay, well, tell me, let's talk about that. How do, I mean, how do you come up with that concept? So blind hockey was started back in the 70s up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting the way they did it out there is each area that had a blind hockey team had their own rules and their own puck. So a regular ice hockey game is played in three periods where out there, if they actually played each other, they would play uh, two periods that were dedicated to one team and their rules and their puck. And then the other two periods would be spent with the other team's rules and the other team's puck. So some teams would use an old coffee can um, with you know screws and washers and stuff in it that would make some noise. And the other team had their own modification of the puck. So it was really interesting to try to see how that worked throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and really into the 2000s. And then Matt Morrow, who is now the president of, or executive director of Canadian Blind Hockey and International Blind Hockey, kind of brought all the teams together, got all the leaders of each team together, and said, okay, we need to decide on one puck. We need to decide on one set of rules. And then instead of having teams play as individual teams, what they did is they divided the tournaments into individual players. So from Indiana Blind Hockey, we might have five players that go to a tournament, but we're not necessarily all gonna be on the same team. And the reason they do that is blind hockey is the only um, blind sport that allows all levels of blindness, whether it's a B1, B2, or B3, to all play on the same field, where usually you're separated out or everybody wears um, the sleep shades like in beat baseball. And so it allows those who have you know, 2200 vision, um, they're just on the cusp of being legally blind, they can still use their vision while they're playing. And also, um, whether you're totally blind, you're still out there with the higher vision players as well. So it's really cool to see how the sport has developed um, in that way with using, you know, you have someone that has, you know, good vision for a blind person, and then you have a totally blind person and really watching how it doesn't matter how much you can see it. It really has to focus on how, how good is your orientation? How well can you skate? Um, you know, what's your stick handling skills like? What's your um, awareness on the ice? Being able to listen to your goalie who's gonna be making a lot of noise so you can keep your orientation on the ice. Now, I know some of our listeners are, and, and viewers are wondering now, hockey, puck, stick. Now, are you guys on skates? We are, we're on ice skates. Oh. Okay, so you have to learn how to skate as mm -hmm. well uh, as, a, as a blind uh, person, right? Yep, and that's one thing that's really cool is when you're ice skating, it's a lot to do with feel. So even coaching blind or sighted people how to skate, you're gonna be teaching them how to feel with their foot, feeling there's an inside and outside edge on the blade. And so when you're pushing, uh, how you wanna feel that on your foot, how you wanna, cause you're not gonna be able to look down and see your foot as you're doing it. If you're skating, you always wanna keep your head up. You always hear coaches of all levels yelling to their players, you know, chin up, chin up, chin up. So they keep their head up in the air and they're um, keeping their eyes forward and that's for balance. And so it's, um, it's really fun to get out there with people who think, oh, I'm blind, I can't ice skate. And the reason when they get out there, it's just, just the same as walking, they can do whatever they want to do. Well, you know, I've never been on a pair of ice skates and um, that might be something um, I might like to, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to, uh, your orientation and mm -hmm. your mobility skills out there using, you know, it's a lot, sometimes when you talk about keeping your chin up, uh, like typing, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you don't look down at the keys. That's exactly. how you were taught, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, that helped me a lot um, uh, in life. And when I lost my sight, you know, I, there was no need to look down at the keys. Exactly. You know? So I'm, I'm, you know, so... I'm still kind of baffled. So one thing we'll, we'll do is we'll tell people, because they think I'm, you know, if they don't have their cane on the ice, you know, how are they going to get around? And we have a hockey stick. So you pretty much trade in your cane for your hockey stick. You can use your hockey stick just like a cane. You can, you know, swipe it in front of you to see where you're going. Um, you'll use it to find the boards. Uh, you'll also use it, you know, you'll listen to the puck. And our puck's a little bit different. A normal um, able body hockey puck is about two and a half, three inches in diameter and about an inch tall and it's solid rubber. So it's not making any noise on the ice. And then now the blind hockey puck is twice the size. So it's about five and a half inches in diameter and two inches tall. And I got one right here. Yeah, let me, let me see that thing there. Yeah. So that's the puck. And so if you rattle it. 
Okay, so that lets you know where that puck is at. Yep. And, and it's going at a very fast rate of speed, right? Yep, so the puck, when you're taking a shot, can go anywhere between um, 40 to 50 miles an hour. Now, what kind of equipment do you wear, uh, um, you know, to keep yourself from being injured? Because this here is a nice little piece of metal. Yep. And so as a, as a forward or a defenseman, you're going to wear skates, shin pads, um, hockey pants, which have pads in them, shoulder pads, elbow pads, helmet and gloves. And then as a goalie, you're going to wear the same standard goalie pads um, in able body hockey, which is a different style of helmet to protect the face and neck. It's going to be um, a larger set of shoulder pads and arm pads that really cover the whole top of your body. And then you have real big leg pads on that um, uh, will be used to deflect the puck and you have a different set of gloves. So you have a blocker glove, which is a glove with a big um, plate on one side of it to hold your stick, and then you can block the puck with the pad. And then like a catcher's mitt, um, kind of like a baseball glove, that you're gonna use in your other hand. And um, like I mentioned earlier, the goalies have to be totally blind. It's a requirement um, for all blind hockey. And uh, Doug Goas, who plays for the Washington Wheelers and is also on the national blind hockey team um, that I play on, he makes glove saves. And it's, it was one of the craziest things to see. He can hear the puck, he hears it coming, and he can snag it right out of the air. Wow. Okay, uh, Daniel, now for people who are um, interested in uh, blind hockey, mm -hmm. is there an age range? There, um, so usually about three or four years old is when you can um, start. If you want to start learning how to skate when you're um, two years old, that's when I learned how to skate. Um, you can start learning to skate as, as soon as your parents will let you. And then we'll start having players out there between three and four years old, all the way up to whatever age you want to keep playing. If you want to do it at 100, we'll get you out there at 100. Um, and that's a, that's a great thing about blind hockey. We're not just there to play hockey. We're not just there to, um, to be competitive. It's an opportunity for people of all different um, visual levels, um, blindness experience, whether you might be new to blindness, whether it's been something you've had your entire life. It's an opportunity for someone like me who has a degenerative eye disease um, to go from being feeling more competitive when I was younger with more sight to losing sight and wondering, you know, I thought my hockey career was over at 15. And then at age 30, I find out that there's blind hockey and I can keep playing. I can, I can keep pursuing my dream. And then knowing that the, the more vision I lose, my dream's not gonna end. I might change positions. I might have to adapt a different way of playing the sport, but um, it doesn't have to end that way. And if people just wanna get out and skate and be around in a, in a community of other people that are, um, um, living the same life they are, living with blindness and um, being able to show each other different technology, being able to help each other learn braille or different um, tips and tricks on just being blind and how to make your daily life easier. So it's a really, it's a really fun place to be. And, um, you know, we have a lot of people that are, you know, once they get um, older in age, they start losing sight due to macular degeneration or other eye conditions. And um, it's a great place for them to still get out and be able to um, be involved in an active community. Wow, and, and that, that just builds a whole lot of uh, courage as well, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, you, you're kind of having me thinking about uh, coming out of my shell and, and trying to just even just get on a pair of skates. We'd love to uh, have um, you out there. Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, from three, I'm closer to 100 than I am to three. <laughs> so that will be a challenge for me. We'll be right back uh, with more um, with Daniel and this uh, hockey. We'll be right back. I'm Danny Wayne Beamer, Program Manager of the Elder Blind Program at the Will Center in Terre Haute, Indiana. I introduced the NFB Newsline to seniors in 13 southwestern counties in Indiana. I also utilize the NFB Newsline for my radio station public affairs shows. The NFB Newsline. Experience it today. Learn more by calling 855-963-6476 or visit nfbnewsline-in.org. We are the The National Federation of the Blind knows that blindness is not the characteristic that defines you or your future. Every day we raise the expectations of blind people because lower expectations create obstacles between blind people and our dreams. You can live the life you want. Blindness is not what holds you back. Daniel? Okay, now what's going on now with your uh, with blind hockey? So right now we've been able to partner with um, 
IYHA, Indiana Youth Hockey Association. And what they're allowing us to do is have players come out to their learn to play hockey and give us space for learn to play blind hockey. So right now we have three players, um, not including myself. I'm uh, taking more on the role of coaching right now. And it allows them to get on the ice and start from the basics of learning how to skate, to uh, learning how to stick handle, to learning different um, strategies on playing the game. And they, um, they've been great with us. They've gotten everybody equipment. And that's really the big cost is getting the equipment out there. So we've been up in Carmel at the Ice Stadium. And they have a link on their page that you can go to for uh, Learn to Play Blind Hockey. They've been really great to give us a discount for our participants that want to play. And then we're also working with them to do a um, learn to play blind hockey at bigger events, um, maybe quarterly is what we've been talking about every three months. But we really just want to come out and try it for the first time. Um, not really sure, um, kind of like Lee here, try to get him out there <laughs> and really try to um, just get them more involved and give them an opportunity to do it for free before they make a more financial commitment um, on a monthly basis. We've also been able to partner with the Athenaeum Foundation um, to help us get our nonprofit status going. They've allowed us, to, as a uh, fiscal sponsor, this allows us to start receiving donations through them. Um, and that way we can build up um, our finances to help provide equipment to players, transportation. Ice time is the biggest thing. It's the biggest expense you'll ever have in hockey. And so trying to um, just raise money um, to make sure we can get our players to the events. There's two events here in America. There's the uh, Blind Summit, which takes place at the beginning of the hockey season in October, and then the Disabled Hockey Festival, which takes place um, end of March, beginning of April every year to kind of cap off the season, uh, with more events going on in Canada. So this year we're hoping to be able to help uh, send one player out uh, to Florida for the Disabled Festival to get them playing um, in a blind hockey tournament. And then um, hopefully within the next couple of years, we'll be able to start playing against teams like Chicago Blackhawks blind hockey, Minnesota Wild blind hockey, and St. Louis Blues blind hockey. Um, kind of a Midwest showdown is what I've been calling it. Try to get um, more teams out here and really build the awareness within the communities um, in the Midwest. That is so fantastic. And I'm so proud of you and the courage that you have You're from six years old to now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I can't express that enough. I, so when we found out that I was blind, she, uh, the doctor said I couldn't play hockey anymore. And she said, wasn't he blind last year? Hmm. And he said, yeah. And so we played hockey last year. And wow. so that was really a big, my mom always told me blindness would never be the reason not to do something. No excuse. And um, it's, been, it's been a real blessing to have her in my corner every step of the way. When I played sided hockey as a kid, she lost her voice every weekend, you know, yelling, you know, left, right, forward, back, <laughs> you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and um, it was imagine. a seize to have her. And if anybody wants to check us out on Facebook, we're at Indiana Blind Hockey. And you can also check out blindhockey.com or usablindhockey.com to gather more information about the sport. And we'll have that information scrolling across the screen. And I want to thank you once again. And you know, you can live the life you want mm -hmm. and blindness does not have to hold you back. That's right. The National Federation of the Blind, Newsline, Indiana. For more information, go to nfb-in.org or call 855-963-6476. That's 855-963-6476. The National Federation of the Blind encourages you to live the life you want.